there, this is a thought for the day. Um, and this thought for the day is called The Game of Black and White. And I'm reading from the book on the taboo against knowing who you are by Alan Watts. And I'm starting on page 21. And I've picked a number of paragraphs I'm going to string together uh, between page 21 and page 31. So it starts. When we were taught 1, 2, 3, and A, B, C, few of us were ever told about the game of black and white. It is quite as simple, but belongs to the hushed up side of things. Consider first that all your five senses are differing forms of one basic sense, something like touch. Seeing is highly sensitive touching. The eyes touch or feel light waves, and so enable us to touch things out of the reach of our hands. Similarly, the, the ears touch sound waves in the air, and the nose, tiny particles of dust and gas. But the complex patterns and chains of neurons which constitute these senses are composed of neuron units which are capable of changing between just two states, on or off. To the central brain, the individual neuron signals either yes or no. That's it. But as we know from computers which employ binary arithmetic in which the only figures are zero and one, these simple elements can be formed into the most complex and marvelous patterns. Now I want to repeat something that I had in another thought for the day, and this is about the head-tailed cat. It's kind of a reminder. So here is someone who has never seen a cat. He's looking through a narrow slit in a fence, and on the other side, a cat walks by. He sees first the head, and then the less distinctly shaped furry trunk, and then the tail. Extraordinary. The cat turns around and walks back, and again he sees the head, and a little later the tail. This sequence begins to look like something regular and reliable. Yet again, the cat turns around and he witnesses the same regular sequence. First the head, and later the tail. Thereupon, he reasons that the head is the invariable and necessary cause of the event tail, which is the head's effect. This absurd and confusing gobbledygook comes from his failure to see that the head and the tail go together. They are all one cat. We also speak of attention as noticing. To notice is to select, to regard some bits of perception or some features of the world as more noteworthy, more significant than others. To these we attend, and the rest we ignore. For which reason, conscious attention is at the same time ignorance. Despite the fact that it gives us a vividly clear picture of whatever we choose to notice. So we have attention ignorance. Physically, we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch innumerable features that we never notice. You can drive 30 miles talking all the time to a friend. What you noticed and remembered was the conversation, but somehow you responded to the road, to other cars, the traffic lights, and heaven knows what else without really noticing or focusing your mental spotlight on them. So, too, you can talk to someone at a party without remembering for immediate recall what clothes he or she was wearing. 
because they were not noteworthy or significant to you. Yet, certainly, your eyes and nerves responded to these clothes. You saw, but you did not really look. It seems that we notice through a double process in which the first factor is a choice of what's interesting or important. The second factor, working simultaneously with the first, is that we need a notation for almost anything that can be noticed. Notation is a system of symbols. Words, numbers, signs, images, uh, maybe like squares and triangles, or musical notes, letters, ideographs as in Chinese, and scales for dividing and distinguishing variations of color or tones. Such symbols enable us to classify our bits of perception. They are the labels on the pigeonholes into which memory sorts them. But it's most difficult to notice any bit for which there is no label. Eskimos have five words for different kinds of snow because they live with it and it's important to them. But the Aztec language has only one word for snow, rain, and hail. What governs what we choose to notice? The first is whatever seems advantageous or disadvantageous for our survival, our social status, or the security of our egos. The second is the pattern and the logic of all the notation symbols which we have learned from others, from our society and our culture. So it's hard indeed to notice anything for which the languages available to us, whether verbal, mathematical, or musical, have no description. Thus, there must be numberless features and dimensions of the world to which our senses respond without our conscious attention. To perceive all vibrations at once would be pandemonium. As when someone slams down all the keys of the piano at the same time, but there are two ignored factors which can very well come into our awareness and our ignorance of them is the mainstay of the ego illusion and of the failure to know that we are each one self in disguise. The first is not realizing that so-called opposites such as light and dark, sound and silence, solid and space, on and off, zero and one, inside and outside, cause and effect are simply poles or aspects of the same thing. But we have no word for that thing other than vague concepts such as God, being, or the ultimate ground of being. For the most part, these remain nebulous ideas without becoming vivid feelings or experiences. The second is that we are so absorbed in conscious attention, so convinced that this narrowed kind of perception is not only the real way of seeing the world, but also the very basic sensation of oneself as a conscious being, that we're fully hypnotized by its disjointed vision of the universe. We really feel that this world is indeed an assemblage of separate things that have somehow come together or maybe fallen apart and that we are each only one of them. We see them all alone, born alone, dying alone, maybe as bits and fragments of a universal whole or expendable parts of a big machine. But rarely do we see all so-called things and events going together like the head and tail of the cat 
or as the tones and inflections rising and falling, coming and going of a single singing voice. In other words, we do not play the game of black and white, the universal game of up, down, on slash off, solid slash space, and each slash all. Instead, we play the game of black versus white, or more usually, white versus black. And it's no connotation with race here, just color. For especially when the rates of vibration are slow as with day and night, or life and death, we are forced to be aware of the negative aspect of the world. And then not realizing the inseparability of positive and negative poles, we're afraid that one side will win the game, either black or white. But the game is no longer a game. It's a fight. A fight haunted by a sense of chronic frustration because we are doing something as crazy as trying to keep the mountains and get rid of the valleys. So that's a thought to take you through your day. Are you playing the game of black and white or are you playing the game of black versus white? On versus off, mountain versus valley. Are you seeing everything in your life as part of a wholeness? Something that you are part of and it's part of you? Think about that as you go through your day and make a great day. <laughs>